So we have another nearly doctor in the house tonight. This is uh, this PhD, uh, this PhD from the University of Toronto candidate adores amphibians and reptiles like a lot. He researches and seeks to understand the impact of our environments on one of the many little things that run the world, the mighty salamander. Patrick Molodon has morphed his passion for wildlife into globally relevant research and impactful conservation efforts, earning him Canada's new NOAA scholarship from the Wildlife Preservation Canada. A little high five to you salamanders. All right, Patrick, are you ready to go? I am, thank you very much, Erica and Alex. Um, it, and everybody here this evening, it's wonderful to see you and, and thanks for joining. Uh, this evening, I, I'm here to share with you a place that's very near and dear uh, to me, but I'm sure to you too in your own very special way. Um, <clears throat> when I uh, became familiar with the Wilderness and Canoe Symposium a few years ago, it really occurred to me how much wilderness means different things to different people. And to me, at least as wilderness is concerned in Algonquin Park, it's a living laboratory. I'd just like to start off to pay our respects on behalf of the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station um, that we, uh, alongside the Indigenous inhabitants of the land, are traditional stewards of the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station and the land on which Algonquin Park resides present day. Um, we're located on unceded Algonquin territory, uh, which includes the territories of the Anishinaabe and specifically the Chippewa, Ojibwe, and Nipissing peoples. Um, this land has also been used by the Métis and other Indigenous peoples uh, in time memorial. We're always open to discussion and learning, um, and we thank, uh, we thank the Indigenous peoples of our land on which we work. For those of you who are joining us from an international audience today, I wanted to orient. Uh, here in South Central Ontario, we're uh, very fortunate to have Canada's and Ontario's iconic Algonquin Provincial Park. Established in 1893, this mixed-use protected area is perhaps best well-known and admired for its protected wilderness landscape, being both fairly accessible for major metropolitan hubs in the south of the province, Ottawa and Toronto. Um, the mixed-use allows for land, water and wildlife preservation, as well as certain degrees of recreation and, and selective logging. The park itself is huge, um, especially for an area in south central Ontario with just some quick uh, visual comparisons there. You know, Algonquin Park alone at approximately 7,600 kilometers is a quarter the size of Belgium. The park, if nothing else, is known as a land of lakes and rivers. Of course, for those of us, uh, for generations who have gone backcountry camping and soaking it all in as one of our more accessible natural and wilderness spaces, uh, fishing, camping, canoeing, public travel, and of course, those glorious fall colors are what welcome us back year after year. And so too do a lot of the really charismatic wildlife, especially the sexy megafauna, like the moose, the bear, and the wolves, of course, the ecosystem engineers are beavers, uh, iconic Canadian loon. Uh, but I'm here as well to share a little bit today about maybe the lesser appreciated but no less important uh, critters that we share this landscape with, how fortunate we are to do so. From an ecological standpoint, Algonquin is, is really important. It, it connects as a corridor to the Adirondacks, just to our south, um, and as a large intact area, it supports uh, wildlife and wilderness landscapes. In particular, the park was established to protect the headwaters that feed southern Ontario and supply our communities with glorious fresh water. Of course, outside of an ecological context, Algonquin has played a really important role of the Canadiana uh, heritage, our perspective and our culture, perhaps epitomized best with the artworks of the Group of Seven, famed Canadian artists. And at least one thing we can all share in common and commiserate over, <laughs> whether it's on backcountry travels or just a day visit, are of course those biting insects in the months of May and June. Um, but perhaps one thing that's maybe a bit more unique uh, to you about Algonquin is the whole research and science side of things. The truth is what goes on behind the scenes mostly takes place out of sight and out of mind, but it's our research that's forming park policy, as well as the sorts of things you read about in the popular park newsletter like The Raven, uh, and uh, making its way into the scientific literature as well. So, if you've ever wondered what the turtles are up to, uh, how you learn to play drums on a moose antler, what turkey basters are probably best used for, 
uh, and all odds and sods of other things, uh, I welcome you here today. And I welcome you to the wildlife research area. Tucked in a relatively discreet area of Algonquin Park sandwiched between the iconic Canoe Lake and Lake Obiango is the wildlife research area, a wilderness zone that is removed from leaseholders, public travel, uh, fishing and other, other uses. Uh, and instead it was reserved solely as a wilderness zone for wildlife research. In 1944, the provincial government established this area, which would become known as the Wildlife Research Area, and upon which would be established the Wildlife Research Station. The station itself is pretty modest, uh, and it's evolved through time. Here are just some photos of our cookhouse going from a bit of a shanty uh, cabin style uh, tent to a more formalized cookhouse. And perhaps paradoxically, the thing that I'll share with you is that the WRS is caught in a bit of a time warp. These photos through time show that really not that much changes, but at the very same time, everything changes because nature is dynamic. Uh, and, and that's what we learn through its study. Um, <clears throat> although established in 1944, by 1949 at the southern edge of the wilderness area, the wildlife research station really began to take, uh, take shape. A small number of cabins were built along the shorelines of Lake Sasajewan, and that cookhouse was formalized as really the heart of the research station. Um, modest laboratory facilities were built uh, a few years later as well to help serve, especially a lot of the parasitology and, and do wildlife disease based research that would take place. And again, not that much has changed. The forest has grown up around the space, as we like to see. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I, I think the most important thing to, to, that I hope to convey to you is the process of science and, and how we learn, um, but also that science doesn't occur in a vacuum. It, because, it, it occurs because of people and the great people we work with. Generations of biologists uh, and scientists in training have called the Wildlife Research Station home now for nearly 80 years. Um, you know, there are a lot of famous faces to be named and I wish I had more time, but for now, I figured I'd just show some postings from the notebook of now well-known artist, Robert Bateman, including his paintings uh, on our home lake and lots of other wildlife illustration where he worked of all things, washing dishes and, and doing bird surveys. So the WRS family is a large and extended one, and I hope today to showcase just a small touch of that through our wildlife research, and I hope to show you a different side of the park and uh, have you develop an even greater appreciation for the wildlife we share the space with. Today, uh, the WRS is a not-for-profit institution with the main mission to inspire, to conserve, and to educate. You know, we strive for environmental stewardship, community of collaboration, and connections with nature. We have a vested interest in conserving biodiversity, ecological integrity, and importantly, getting people into the field to experience wilderness firsthand. Importantly, to educate others through our science, to convey that to the public and policymakers. And much of what I'll talk about right now are long-term ecological studies. And I think this will ring true with this crowd, especially that long-term ecological research is really important in part because nature uh, unfolds over long periods of time. Understanding things over long periods establishes our baselines, which are so important if we're to protect our natural spaces. It also allows us to gauge environmental change, from a purely scientific perspective, we begin to formulate and test important theories about the way the world works and the way it ought to work, and then perhaps the way it's changed as well. And at least in a wilderness area, it happens at scales that are relevant for management protection. Ultimately, this allows us to ask, start with relatively simple questions like what or how, and uh, instead evolve them into why um, and really dig into wildlife. So as you might expect, a lot of the thinking around the time of the 1940s and 1950s was really focused on the sort of things you could either hook, shoot, or skin. You know, the sort of utilitarian standpoint is really reflected in the research of wildlife uh, in Algonquin Park at the time, because that's what the government had a vested interest in. Um, black flies are a little bit of an oddball in there, but they were of interest mainly because they transmit uh, avian disease, and so they're interested in that regard. But over time, you know, this has begun to change from purely applied research to more blue sky science and curiosity driven work. The station has done natural history and applied conservation projects across the spectrum. I'll showcase a few of those for you this evening. 
I want to start with a bit of a David and Goliath story. And I say this uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, but really it's a fascinating case study of how um, learning about the natural world not only begins to uh, unravel its complexity, um, but goes on with what start as basic natural history questions to inform much broader conservation. When we think of moose, perhaps there's nothing, you know, more majestic on at least the southern central Ontario landscape than a big bull moose. Uh, the truth is these animals are incredible uh, for their resilience. Not only do they have to fend off huge swaths of predators, but with their sheer size, they have to consume huge amounts of food, especially over the winter when females are also pregnant. And the truth is it really wears on them. <clears throat> on the left side of your screen here is a spring moose and it's run ragged almost lost a lot of its hair to, to winter tick. Around the turn of the 19th century, there was widely report or wide reports across Eastern and Central North America, something called a moose sickness. There's an example of this mo a moose demonstrating this sickness on the right hand side. And it was undiagnosed and, and unwent, it went undiagnosed for several decades at a time. These moose were characterized by having floppy heads. They were unresponsive to danger or threats. They would sort of just lull around, even walking in circles, being completely approachable before finally they, they would collapse. Um, and it was a big mystery as to why this was. Moose populations were starting to plummet uh, and it, it was really uncertain what the cause was. Um, enter around 19, uh, the 1960s to the 1970s when Roy Anderson, then of the University of Guelph, uh, began looking for ways to address this situation, purely out of an interest in parasitology, but later, um, unbeknownst to him, it would have massive resounding impacts for understanding of moose biology and conservation. Uh, taking uh, moose calves that were abandoned or perhaps a bit of a ethical a question today, catching a number of calves, they raise them in natural settings at the wildlife research station within the wildlife research area. And the main impetus behind this was to study what were the symptoms and possibly the causes and consequences of this moose sickness. Uh, so here are some photos spread through the 1960s of raising these moose calves. <clears throat> Again, a lot of this was curiosity driven by checking in on moose, watching their behavior, feeding and tragically the onset of their deaths for the most part, through observational and some experimental work, they began to decode this mystery behind the moose sickness. And here it is, for an animal that can weigh half a ton, it's brought down by a surprisingly small parasite. This is called the moose brain worm. And I would try to pronounce that scientific name for you there, if only I thought I could. Uh, but what's fascinating about this is it took Anderson and his team uh, nearly a decade to unravel. And in fact, mysteries uh, or, or clues would come from overseas from researchers studying agricultural livestock in Japan to really get to the bottom of it. And, and here it is. Um, this parasite is spread through the forest, mostly by deer, which I'll discuss in a moment. Those eggs of the parasite are taken up by snails and slugs. Those are inadvertently ingested by moose. They migrate through the gut of the moose and the lower intestinal tract into the spinal column before infecting the brain and causing these neurological symptoms and eventual paralysis. The sheer complexity of this began to really baffle scientists in questioning how how this could be and, and why would these parasites have such startling impacts on moose, but not a lot of other animals that they coexist with? Well, moose, um, it comes down to really their evolutionary history. Moose evolved in Eurasia and crossed the Bering Land Bridge about 10,000 years ago into North America. It was at that time that their naive immune systems encountered the parasites that have been transmitting for thousands of years up to that point in white-tailed deer. It turns out deer are the major host of this parasite, which then transfers intermediately to the slugs and the snails, and eventually reaches a dead end in the moose, quite literally in this case, a dead end. By uncovering this pathway, we learned a lot. Um, it's not surprising that moose and deer tend to occupy fairly exclusive habitats because where they co-occur, deer surprisingly kill moose. 
So forget predators and prey, it's really these little things like parasites that have overwhelming impacts in a lot of our natural systems. Um, and knowledge of things like winter tick and moose brainworm um, have been really pivotal for understanding how we keep moose populations intact uh, across our landscape in North America. <clears throat> Starting in the 1960s, wolves, of course, became of great interest uh, to researchers in Algonquin. Prior to that, they were of great interest too, but unfortunately, mostly as vermin and pests, they were killed mercilessly um, across the Algonquin landscape. Um, this was mostly initiated by Doug, Doug Pimlot, uh, then of the Department of Lands and Forest in Ontario, who would eventually become a professor of forestry at the University of Toronto. And he was fascinated by their pack dynamics, the importance of wolves in structuring uh, landscapes. Really, he pioneered methods in wolf communication. For those of you who have enjoyed Algonquin's public wolf howls today, that technique was ultimately derived from the early works of Doug Pimlot. And what was fascinating is back in the uh, late 1950s through early 1960s, Doug raised litters of wolf pups at the station to understand pack dynamics and natural communication. So literally a pack of wolves were raised on site in order to understand a bit of their domestic uh, or more domestic ecology, which would prove to be highly informative uh, thereafter. It was Doug's advocacy work, not only in science, but in the greater public at large that would end uh, the wolf cull uh, within Algonquin Park and soon start putting boundaries up. Although I could literally talk the whole night to you about this, here's where we are today. You know, fast forward uh, half a century, and we still get a lot of questions at the research station about Algonquin's wolves. Um, Algonquin is home to the eastern wolf, a threatened species here in Canada, and the core of its range designated with these circular spots, uh, the genetics tell us that these are indeed eastern wolves. But in surrounding landscapes around the park, you see huge genetic hybridization happening with coyotes here in red and gray wolves, also known as timber wolves, here in blue. So really in south central Ontario, we have what researchers jokingly call a canid soup. It's a mixed alphabet soup of all kinds of different uh, wolves, the brush wolf, the coyote, the eastern or Algonquin wolf, and finally the gray or timber wolf. The truth is we get a lot of photos sent to us as well, and it's extremely hard to tell them apart because the, the proof is in the pudding, really. It's in, it's in their genetics. Um, so Algonquin Park, as you can see, is a really important landscape today that protects the Algonquin wolf because outside of Algonquin, they're prone to hybridization, but mostly prone to persecution from hunting, trapping, trapping mortality from cars. Algonquin truly is one of the last and great landscapes of the Algonquin wolf. Uh, and it's an important area to preserve, especially as development begins to encroach further and further north around the park's boundaries. That's just a bit of a historical perspective, and I want to take this opportunity to, sh to showcase in wilderness what the other wildlife has to teach us. Although the station now is about 80 years old, we've been fortunate to have a lot of continuous studies that have gone on over several decades, some of them almost as long as the station. And I'll run through some small mammal uh, community work, the secret that turtles hide, the curious uh, case of carnivorous plants and amphibians, and of course the endearing antler fly. Small mammals are maybe something we don't spend a lot of time thinking about, unless of course they're chewing on something in our tent or getting into our food stuffs, uh, but really they play a disproportionate role in the function of our forest systems. Uh, they're really important seed predators and they govern in very large part the way that our forests operate and regenerate. Uh, beginning in 1952, which makes this project now over 70 years old, we have these long-term data sets on small mammal abundance, and this includes everything from flying squirrels and red squirrels and chipmunks to jumping mice and deer mice and redback voles. You probably never thought there were so many different kinds of small mammals, but uh, on, a, on a permanent uh, survey grid that extends throughout the wilderness uh, area of Algonquin Provincial Park, the study has been ongoing for now over 70 years, studying the dynamics of small mammals, the forests, and in large part, the predators that rely on them. These series of trap lines spread through all different kinds of forests to teach us the dynamics of how the environment governs animal populations and vice versa. A lot of this is live capture uh, and release, putting small ear tags on these animals to eventually retract them over time. 
understand survival and their key processes that they contribute to in our forest. And what I want to just try to impress upon you here in this small plot is the number of captures per trap night over time, in this case, you know, about half a century, and how dynamic it is. These animals respond to the environment and in turn, the environment responds to them. Uh, this will be contrasted pretty sharply with the turtles, which I'll, get, which I'll get to quite shortly as well. But the small mammals uh, are teaching us a lot over recent history about parasites and about disease. As we know, wildlife disease is uh, a huge, uh, huge concern. It was brought to the fore these past couple of years with COVID-19. Uh, but understanding and refining trapping methods, competition, population dynamics, especially forest and the role of small mammals and seeds in forest regeneration uh, are the key focuses of this project. <clears throat> Turtles are a major hallmark study, not, uh, not only because they're charismatic, but I think they really epitomize what it means to do long-term study. If you know nothing else about turtles, you know that they are long lived and therefore it necessitates studying them for a really long time to even understand the basics. So I wanna take this opportunity to introduce you to a dear friend of mine. This is Snapping Turtle A7. You can see she has her little license plate tag right there. Well, A7 was captured the first year of the turtle study in 1972, and she has been captured almost steadily every year since. She is the oldest known snapping turtle with certainty at minimum now. She is approximately 65 to 70 years old but our reasonable growth estimates in her reproductive history suggests that she's probably well over a century now. But the truth is we still don't know after 50 years of studying turtles how long they live. And it's because they're about to outlive the researchers who started the study. Uh, you know, just as we're here with the Canoe and Wilderness Symposium, the snapping turtles come for a ride as well. Uh, this is X10, also known as Babyface. And although his claws are a little intimidating, the truth is that he's a real softy. Um, here he is coming in for his annual checkup. As we catch turtles, we weigh and measure them. We're studying populations. We're studying where and how they nest on the natural landscape. But more importantly, we're studying how their populations operate. And that's really important today because turtles are one of the most imperiled groups of backbone animals in the world. That is to say, they face the highest uh, extinction risk. This is true even here at home. You can see Ontario has a pretty poor history of protecting our turtles. Unfortunately, only our uh, painted turtle is a species not at risk here in Ontario, or a special concern, threatened, endangered, and even extirpated, which means no longer present in the province. Um, we have a lot of work to do to bring our turtles back in some cases from the brink. And that starts by understanding basic facets of their biology, again, which requires long-term study. And this is exemplified right here in this figure. Here are snapping turtles uh, go growing through time. And by approximately ages 16 to 20 years, that is when a snapping turtle reaches sexual maturity and reproduces for the first time. So they have to live approximately 20 years before they begin to reproduce. When you contrast that against a lot of other wildlife that we're more familiar with protecting or at least managing, things like black bear, moose, white-tailed deer, you can see their life histories are so different. These mammals that we're so used to working with mature early, they are very prolific in how they produce offspring, and they're very much capable of recovering after population declines. The key takeaway is that is not true of turtles, and this is what really challenges our protection of them. And that's where the wildlife research station's work is so important. For instance, our work has shown that approximately 1,400 eggs need to be laid by a single snapping turtle before it produces at least a single offspring to replace itself. That is likely to only happen after 50 years. These animals play the long game and they need to be protected as such. But that's really hard in a landscape where we drain wetlands and bisect their habitat with roads where they're prone to being struck and killed by cars. We've had the opportunity to have a natural experiment of sorts. And again, this is one of the serendipitous things that come from long-term studies. In the winters of 1987, 88, and 89, there's a mass mortality of snapping turtles. And it was because of these guys, river otters. 
River otters are normally uh, continuously distributed on the landscape and co-occur with turtles all the time. Um, but surprisingly, in those winters in the 1980s, they absolutely decimated a population of snapping turtles at our core study sites. In fact, the population survival here, one would mean 100% survival, dipped into the low 60% survival over these three winters. Consequently, the population declined by 60%. And as you can see in the now almost quarter century since that population has failed to recover. The really important thing to say here about these turtles and the way that we protect them and we, we use our natural and intact wilderness spaces to do so is that uh, <clears throat> they, they do not recover quickly. And it's, it's in part because they're so long lived and, and they need to, to be protected on long-term timescales. What this really means is that rather than trying to recover them after catastrophe has happened, we need to prioritize protection of existing populations. And when turtles are under so many diverse threats as we lose our wilderness landscape, um, they will be the first to decline, unfortunately. But the work at the wildlife station fortunately was crucial in implementing an end to the provincial snapping turtle hunt in 2017. If you could believe it, we are still harvesting these animals at an unsustainable rate um, up to that time. And these turtles throw surprises to us all the time because they live so long and in some ways they're quite enigmatic, they disappear. This for instance is our old friend snapping turtle R10 who disappeared for 26 years only to be recaptured in 2018. So I think T turtles have an important lesson to teach us and that is that they're the ultimate in perseverance in many ways and uh, just when you think they're down and out they're probably just in hiding, probably in a, a bog or <laughs> swamp somewhere. Uh, and speaking of animals that have a lot to tell us about our natural landscape and how important it is, uh, that is of the amphibians. Um, and this is particularly near and dear to me because this is the subject of my PhD work. Amphibians might be small, but they are very, very mighty. And although it may have been a very long time since you've seen a salamander, what I have to say to you is you need to get out more or at least get out on cold, rainy nights of the spring because that's when most salamanders are active. Uh, this figure here <laughs> shows uh, animals scaled in proportion to their biomass, that is their living tissue mass on the landscape. The famous conservationist E.O. Wilson said, it's the little things that run the world and ain't this the truth. So I won't say that wolves and bears and moose are not important. But compared to the you know, gargantuan invertebrates, the, the proportionately large size small mammals and this Godzilla of a salamander, it's these small things that have really important linkages in the natural web of life as both predators and prey and cycling nutrients through our systems. So a lot of our work at the station these days is focused on using amphibians as our modern day canary in the coal mine and that our research studies salamander populations and more recently frogs and their biology in our rapidly changing world. Um, and these here are the little gems, uh, our little diamonds in the rough. Uh, these are spotted or yellow spotted salamanders and they have those very charismatic yellow polka dots. Um, I work throughout most of the spring and uh, into the fall as well, calling the Wildlife Research Station home for about four to six months a year, surveying for these otherwise really hard to find animals. Um, you know, we weigh, catch them, um, mark them, identify them through time, and it's amazing how complex these lives in the leaf litter really are. Um, these are our common amphibians of Algonquin Park, uh, diverse in form and biologies from frogs and salamanders and toads and newts. Um, and what's fascinating, you know, you might wonder how the heck do you study a salamander? Well, here it is. When you look at these three salamanders, they have a spot pattern that's as unique as a fingerprint. And we use that to identify individuals and follow them through time. This is one of my most favorite salamanders, 0076. And 0076 here has uh, been captured, for instance, in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 16, 17. Over that time, she's grown about uh, 10 millimeters in body length and added at 2.5 grams. 
what does it all mean? Well, this is again, much like the turtles, really important for understanding these, these so-called canaries in our coal mine, understanding their biologies and, and a, a lot of the things we don't know about even their basic biology. This figure here, for instance, shows our studies of their habitat. Understanding how animals use the landscape is crucial to protecting it. And the size of these circles is proportional to the number of salamanders that breed at these areas of this particular wetland. And so you can see, for instance, these spots are really important. These spots are really important. Of course, there's no threat of losing these lakes in Algonquin, but there is further south in cottage country. And so understanding how these animals use the landscape has broad application. You know, you might think those salamanders are small. They probably don't live very long. But in fact, we see individuals that are living uh, 10, 12, 13 years. This plot here shows males in white and females in gray. And the number of individuals that are parsing into these different age categories. Uh, and so we have a lot of males that breed early in life. Females mature later and begin breeding. And in fact, there are some records from elsewhere in Quebec that these animals live over 30 years. Uh, you know, the, the salamanders are no passing fad down in the leaf litter. We might not see them often, but they're there to stay and they're really important to our natural systems. Uh, pressing is our natural landscape and change, climate change. Uh, here, particularly with fall temperatures, we see rapidly warming conditions over the past century and earlier spring ice out. What we've seen from our past decade of work is that uh, salamanders are losing body condition. That is to say, they're not quite as fat uh, as they used to be. And we know that having these robust frames are really important for overcoming challenges, surviving, for instance. Uh, but yet, uh, these salamanders are slimming. And so uh, what does that mean? Well, I think we'll see what the future holds. Um, but it is reason to have a little bit of concern. We're studying the reproduction and the lifespan, survival and cycles in these animals. We're studying individual populations in these natural systems. But importantly, there's also things we didn't even think to ask. And that, for instance, is the case of salamanders falling prey to carnivorous plants. For example, we discovered just a couple of years ago that juvenile salamanders are landing inside our carnivorous pitcher plants, which are so charismatic uh, or characteristic rather of our bogs here in, uh, in Ontario and Eastern Canada. Um, that is really quite baffling. Nobody's recorded it uh, on such scales before. So this is what I mean, the, the wonderful contrast of, of uh, driven science versus curiosity driven work. And this is a continued effort by master's student Amanda Semenuk to understand the relationship between plants and salamanders. And I'll close with a bit of this anecdote here about how one moose's trash is a fly's treasure. You know, the natural world just has so much discovery to be had and it's so inspiring in that way. Of course, moose shed their antlers every year. And although we might think that they're really interesting curios curiosities to carry home with us, um, what's actually quite remarkable about them is their little ecosystems unto themselves. Uh, these miniature flies that were discovered uh, in Algonquin Park in 1994 carry out their complex lives on the whole cycle of uh, a degrading antler. So these antlers are ecosystems in which whole communities of organisms live, mold and bacteria, flies and the things that eat them. What's remarkable is researchers have adopted these flies as a model organism to study key themes in ecology and evolution that are otherwise hard to study with other animals on landscape scales. And they have painted, learned how to paint individual tiny numbers and letters on them to, to track these <laughs> remarkable little flies over time. Uh, you know, one of the unlikely uh, things you're, you're likely unlikely to learn uh, coming to do research are things like how to play the drums and how to think about landscape scales on antlers, but uh, this is all part of the antler fly research project and studying the curiosities of these small creatures. So with that, I'll close and I'll thank everybody for their time. Our long-term studies are really just a small facet of what we do. A major pillar of the research station is to operate field courses and educational workshops through time. Um, our research is funded in part through donation as well as continued work uh, and support from uh, academic partners. Um, researchers are working in the park pretty much year round through thick and thin mosquitoes. Um, our modest facilities, uh, of course, are upkept on our small budget. 
and, uh, and really wheelbarrows and shovels go a long way. We have a long family over these 80 years and uh, we hope that you join us as part of our uh, growing family and, and community. You can learn more about us uh, at the Wildlife Research Station online and through our different platforms and we'll soon be releasing our 2022 research report that we look forward to sharing with you. And uh, we'll be posting upcoming workshops and the like as well. So there's so much to appreciate about our wilderness and our natural landscape. Um, the least of which, of course, is, is the, the wildlife uh, and the fascinating natural systems we share it with. So thanks, everybody, for your time, uh, for our support at the research station, and most importantly, for the support of the Wilderness and Canoe Symposium. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Wow, Patrick, thank you so much, folks. Why don't you just scroll on down to the bottom of the screen and send out a big old heart for Patrick. Um, just what an inspiring um, view of truly the most beautiful office I think I've ever seen. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Patrick. Um,